So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, as you know, we are the panel to discuss economic security and the changing workforce. So that means um, the contours of the workforce as it is, how it's different today, how the social safety net has or has not adapted, as well as the kinds of roles that both the private sector and the public sector could play in granting more economic security to today's workers, whether they're in the formal gig economy or otherwise. And joining me to discuss this topic um, are our esteemed panelists. We have Sarah Horowitz, who is the founder of the Freelancers Union and its executive director. She has been helping the new workforce build solutions together for, two, for nearly two decades and is a uh, MacArthur Genius Fellow as well, amongst other uh, commendations, and Deputy Chair of the Federal Reserve of New York. She's a leading voice for the emerging economy. Um, next, we have Betsy Stevenson, who is an Associate Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. She's a Research Fellow with the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research a fellow of the IFO, am I pronouncing that correctly? IFO Institute for Economic Research in Munich, um, also worked in various capacities in the Obama administration on the Council of Economic Advisors and Labor Department as well. Uh, and then Cecilia Munoz, who is the President's Domestic Policy Advisor and Director of the Domestic Policy Council, which coordinates the domestic policy making process in the White House. Previously, she had served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. So thank you to all of our panelists for joining me for this conversation. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about uh, is who we're talking about. So Sarah, I'm wondering if you could just give us kind of an overview of who this workforce is that, that you represent, that you think should be the focus of the conversation over the next day or so. Um, what, what the modal worker looks like. Are we talking just about Uber drivers? Or is there, are, is there another um, broader array of, of workers that we should be thinking about when we're talking about uh, who needs the social safety net to change? You know, I think that in this conversation, we're talking about the gig economy, the share economy, the contingent workforce. We have so many different names. But I think really the best way to be thinking about this is that work itself is getting to be so short term and that people are putting together their work lives through many of these gigs. And so one of the things that I think we'll have lots to, to talk about is that there's really not great, there's just not the numbers that we need to be seeing to get a handle on it. So Freelancers Union has done a study with Upwork and found that it's 54 million Americans. And what we were really trying to show was the breadth of how people are working this way. So some people may be independent contractors and they may have a part-time job. Somebody might have a full-time job and they're going to uh, drive on Lyft. And so what you see is that these numbers are, are hard to come by, but about a third of the workforce is working like this. And then I think you start to see very different things. There are the workers who are independent contractors and are really independent contractors. Uh, I came here today and was greeted by Andrea, who is working for the event company and is a freelancer and has another job. And that is how many people are doing these gigs. She works here like one, two times a year. And one of the benefits is she's really interested in policy, so she gets to, to come here and, and listen. And I don't know where you are, Andrea, but I asked if I could say this. So, you also have great numbers of people who are misclassified who really tend to be lower wage workers and that is really where we need to know what's happening in that. But it really is very, very big number. Um, Betsy, I wanted to ask if you could weigh in a little bit on how the social safety net um, developed as it did in that so much of it sort of piggybacks off of the formal employer-employee relationship. As I understand it, in a lot of other developed countries, that's not quite the case. You don't have retirement programs and health insurance, um, even unemployment type insurance, employment insurance type programs administered through that employee contract. And, and why is it that we've developed as we did? Well, I think that um, all the countries were trying to think about how government can help the private sector um, achieve shared prosperity for everyone. And so you know, what we saw in the last century was a big movement 
um, to have the government play a, a role that was really important in order for the economy to move forward. Um, you know, if you look at each individual case, um, you know, there are different things that happened. Um, if, you know, health insurance in the U.S., uh, President Truman tried to introduce a national health insurance plan and never came to Congress for a vote. You can imagine a very different kind of health uh, insurance system in the United States that looks a lot more like we, what we see in a lot of other countries had that actually passed at the time. Um, instead, we had a big development of private sector health insurance companies, and, and now we have to reckon with you know, an economy that has those private sector entities. You know, similarly, if you look at something like pensions, you know, I, I can't tell you how important this was, but, but part of what happened was in 1942, in order to constrain uh, uh, inflation, there was a moratorium on wage increases, but they said that didn't include benefits. And so what you had was a lot of employers adding pensions in because they could add, they could add in a pension without violating that current law. And you, saw uh, a big increase in the number of employers who added pensions, and they said they were doing this to recruit workers. Um, you still had Social Security, of course, develop, so we're not fully right. uh, a, a private sector uh, type uh, system. So we've always had the government playing a role. Unemployment insurance is really a government program. You have experience rating for firms because we don't want firms to be taking advantage of the program. And that kind of thinking about how you design government programs in a way that means that the private sector works better um, is really important. And I, that is something that means that there is going to be some interaction between the private sector and government, something like experience rating uh, when it comes to Social Security. But there's clearly a role for the government. This is not something that you know, we should be expecting the private sector to do. And that's you know, one of the reasons why we, despite the big growth in pensions, we passed Social Security, Social Security Act. And uh, you know, Social Security has grown. And I think there's nobody out there today, or very few people out there today, who want to see that kind of social safety net end. Mm -hmm. Cecilia, what are some of the ways that today's workers are um, less protected, let's say, by the social safety net than their counterparts from eras past, uh, or ways that they're more exposed to risk? Well, the obvious example is the retirement system, which is completely different. And you know, my, my dad worked in the auto industry. He has a pension. You know, nobody from my generation does, and the likelihood of that, of like a defined benefits plan like that, for example, is gone, is greatly, greatly diminished for folks in the workforce. So that's an obvious example. But we, you know, saw it uh, happening with the healthcare system. The Affordable Care Act actually, obviously, is uh, making a huge difference with respect to making sure that people have coverage if they're not getting coverage through their employers. Um, so, and you know, the, the disparities that we're seeing with, just with respect to wages, uh, disparities with respect to access to leave, um, you know, we're in an environment where folks in the middle class, folks working to get to the middle class really do feel like they are getting squeezed and they are getting less out of this relationship than previous generations. And I think one big question, as Betsy suggests, is sort of the role of government in, in uh, pushing back and creating these kinds of structures. The Affordable Care Act is a great example, but you know, and the president has proposed things like wage insurance, uh, uh, structures to allow small businesses to uh, pool into 401k plans for their workers, for example, as potential government approaches to some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but we're, we're kind of experimenting on all fronts in supporting you know, groups like Sarah's and others in a conversation about, about uh, worker voice. Workers have lost a lot of leverage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's something that, that the president feels really strongly we need to be doing something about. Sarah, you wanted I mean, to? Yeah. I think that one of the major things that's like really missing is the social movement, right? Like we had major social movements in the 1930s that really helped bring about all these great changes. And I think that that's what we're starting to see now is we're seeing what's happening uh, across the country with different, with the Fight for 15, which is really exciting, with fast, com fast food workers, with uh, drivers, that we're starting to see that workers are starting to say, like, we, we need something here. And I think that it won't necessarily be because government is going to, we all, we all smart people will figure this out, but I think it will be this combination of some agitation of people talking about what their issues are and what they want to see in partnership with 
with policymakers. And I think that that's really the thing to be asking ourselves, like the Roosevelt administration did, which was, how do we help build a movement? And so we came up with the National Labor Relations Act that let unions be. And then unions had a business model and a way of being, but I think we've forgotten that. We have to go back to a period in time where we have to say, what's the success metric gonna be for our elected officials that they're gonna show us how much they built these next organizations? Well, how did they use the levers of government to make institutions and organizations for working people grow? Well, and I think that to me would be like the super exciting thing. Well, so the question is, um, through, through, the, through the development of labor organizations and popular movements and things like that, to some extent, that's why some of these firms themselves started providing some of these benefits, right? That they, the unions were bargaining on behalf of workers, workers were realizing what kind of leverage they had, even if they weren't organized. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, what we have seen is that firms are sort of shunting more of the risk that used to be on their balance sheets onto the individual balance sheets of workers themselves, right? If we're talking about retirement security or even health insurance um, or wage security or, or various other kinds of benefits. And the question is why? Um, is it because of the decline of influence of labor organizations? Is it because of globalization? Is it because firms just said health insurance has gotten too expensive and so I'm not, we're not gonna deal with that anymore? Is, is there a different way that firms themselves um, see their role in society? I mean. So I think that you know, people face a lot of risk in their life, and they shouldn't have to deal with that risk on their own. But it's not clear that businesses are equipped to handle that risk for them, and that's why there is a role for government. Um, we don't want people to feel tethered to a particular job because that job is going to be the one that's going to protect, you know, going to be the one that's going to help them in retirement. We want them to be able to move to where they get a better opportunity. So the idea of portability, the idea of being able to, um, you know, to make movements means that we can't expect businesses to be the ones who shoulder all the burden for helping people smooth risk. They're a little bit better able than an individual employee is to handle that risk, but who's even better to handle that risk is for us to share it as a society, and the way for us to share it as a society is to do it through government and not to do it through um, individual employers. Are there private sector um, opportunities, though, for to, to, to sort of step in and provide some, sort of, some form of security? In the green room, we were talking a little bit about the role of you know, the labor force at nonprofits or, or someone else to try to get together and try to pool risk. Yeah. Can that work? Well, I mean, I think that really what we're talking about, to be blunt, is money, no? And so, you know, it would seem to me that what you want to do is figure out, like, how are we going to, you know, risk is a euphemism for, for money as well, because we're seeing people's income go up and down and up and down, and we really have to, if we want to, the economy, by the way, is growing at 1%. Consumption is down because middle class and working class people don't have the money. Henry Ford had the insight that if you give auto workers money, they will buy the cars. We're, we're back in Henry Ford times again, where we got to start getting working and middle class people to have money because they then have to be able to spend if, if you agree with that paradigm, and that's another talk. <laughs> But what I think we have to do is say, maybe the ways that we used to get money from employers is going to be different. And so what we call it is new mutualism, is to say that the next role of government has to be a distributed role of government, not for like social security, which needs to be centralized. It's a great program, it needs to say, great. But to like unemployment, why couldn't local organizations and unions and nonprofits and faith-based groups have the ability to take a piece of that operation get paid for it which would then give them revenue and would then start to build new kinds of constituencies you'd be able to really have huge cultural variations and you know a lot of experimentation and you'd build it in so that the ones that were great did great the ones that were bad like failed but and is, we isn't when we, there isn't there sort of a always a risk of adverse selection though like if if it's not if you don't have mandates if, if not everybody opts into or not everybody has to opt in to um, unemployment insurance for example then well, it's just, you're gonna death spiral, right? Yeah, the but people you, who are most at risk are that's, losing. That's why it needs to be both about money but also about leverage, going back to Sarah's point, earlier point about movements, that you both need to create the structures for, certainly for the labor movement itself, but for other, uh, other new kinds of organizations that, that advocate on behalf of moving these things forward, but also create structures that, that actually engage consumers in this effort. So the same tools that make it possible for people you know, to supplement their incomes by driving an Uber car, 
um, or to work in this gig economy are the same tools which can potentially allow for folks to organize. Uh, and, and you see some examples of this in organizations like coworker.org, who we lifted up uh, along with Sarah's organization and the Worker Voice Summit that we did last October um, at the White House. Um, uh, uh, home care workers are also organizing with Care.com on a pledge for the kinds of treatment that, right. that they're the hoping domestic workers, workers can, the domestic the workers, yeah. that they're hoping to, that they uh, hope to expect out of employers. So that we have platforms that can allow for, uh, for workers to organize with each other, but also hopefully to engage consumers so that, I mean, I go back to this idea that at some level, a, a lot of people in this country have learned to care about the quality of life of the chicken which winds up on their plate and that we can maybe uh, apply the same principle to the quality of life of the workers who get that chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what kinds of tools or platforms are you thinking of when you say that there, there's room for these kinds of platforms? So, Just to make it a little more concrete. I use the example of coworker.org, which is a, it's a small organization. It's a, the, the example that we lifted up uh, in the summit that we did is it's a small organizing effort, but they allowed, they created a mechanism for workers who worked at Starbucks who wanted to campaign to be able to have visible tattoos, right? Which is not quite the standards that we're looking for, but it's a start. But what it did was provide a platform for people who work for the same company, but who were not part of a labor union to connect to each other, to advocate for something that they cared for. And it got the attention of the company and they won. So the question is, can you replicate that in a broader way on other kinds of issues that matter to the workforce. Um, and, and very importantly, to get back to Sarah's point, what's the financial model that can help such organizations grow and thrive and expand their capacity to, to support the workforce. And, and I think that that is like the, the next role of government is to say, it's not just the outcome that we'll know that we're having a success, but what's our distribution line? You know, when you talk about adverse selection, that implies that the groups will hold the risk, but they don't have to only play that role. They can market, they can do plan design, they can be early stage innovators on what's even needed. You know, any kind of thing that you want to do is always is going to have 10 or 20 components to it. Let's start to experiment and say, whoa, you can't like take on risk. That's like too hard right in the beginning, but you're going to try these other levels. And it's really, you know, we, we've seen examples of this before. Um, not to keep harping on the Roosevelts, but this time Teddy was really the one who really brilliantly figured out how to support cooperatives because he said urban areas are getting uh, so much money and are advancing so quickly, and so we have to start start to figure out how we're going to like give birth to this whole movement of cooperatives, which now are very much in red states and are very sophisticated in their economic structures. And they have banks and secondary cooperatives. But that's because the government said it's their job to build and help these independent organizations grow. And I think as we're sitting here struggling with a society where people are so alienated and alone and isolated, which is not what you need in a networked, linked society, Part of it is that we have to be building that social infrastructure, and that's a that's a job for government, and it needs to do it. What's the role of um, state and local governments in these kinds of issues? I mean, because most do it, of, we've been, do it do it more. <laughs> but is there a, a separate role that state and local governments could carve out to try to provide uh, more economic security to workers who are in these? Um, less traditional types of employment arrangements. I, mean, I think one thing that uh, if anybody here is like a mayor or friends of a mayor or a governor, like tell, call them tonight and tell them to do this. Like I think that we need to be experimenting with unemployment insurance mm -hmm. as a way to even out uh, income that is so episodic. And to say this to your point about risk selection, Unemployment, if, if all the independent workers in America went on unemployment, they would bankrupt it in about five seconds because if you are a gig worker, you will be unemployed many times through the course of the year. So we need to start having actuarial calculations and somebody has to try a pilot where they can find out what's the number of people that will be statistically significant, what's the amount of the benefit, and let's watch it over a period of, I don't know, months, and let's start to see if we can think about what happens, and then let's look at the person's spending, or let's look at their bankruptcy rates. I mean, these are the kinds of things that you can't do at national level. 
uh, for a variety of reasons, but operationally, we don't want it to be that big. We've got to see these experiments, and we've got to have leaders who have the vision for how they're going to try it in their area. Under and the, for a variety yeah. of reasons, I think state and local governments are where you can see these kinds of innovations beginning to take root, that there are all kinds of obstacles to be able to do these things at the federal level, and while we could be look, a source of policy as we have been and a source of ideas uh, as we have been and continue to be at the federal level. A lot of the, th there's, there is tons of room for innovation in this space and a lot of that innovation is going to be happening at the state and local level as it Weren't should. there some incentives that were passed a few years ago, Betsy might know about this, um, that um, the, I don't know if it was done through, the, through DOL regulations or through law that basically rewarded states for expanding coverage of unemployment, uh, expanding unemployment insurance coverage, something to that effect? Right, there was some, uh, there were some incentives for, for states to engage in some reforms. Um, unemployment insurance for freelancers is actually one of the harder ones to deal with because of the issue, uh, because it's so hard to know when people can't find work versus when they choose not to, to take work. And so I, that wasn't one where I'm aware of any experimental uh, things that were done. I did want to just add something to the conversation, which is that you know you, you said it's about money, and uh, the thing that's underlying it though is not just money; it's trust. And we've seen a big decline in trust in the U.S. And everybody knows there's been a big decline in trust in government because I don't think you could trust Congress any less than people trust Congress today. Um, but they actually trust each other less as well. So when you ask people, are are most people trustworthy? Um, the People agreeing with that statement has been going down over the last uh, several decades. And so when we don't trust each other, it's actually really hard for any of these kind of you know, networks and local communities to come together. And, but it's also really hard just for the economy to work properly. So that's why solving these problems, building trust, building community, building these kinds of networks, it's not just about you know, creating shared prosperity and helping workers, but it's actually essential for us to continue to have strong economic growth. And that's actually the vision the Roosevelt's had, was not just that we protect workers. We grow the economy and have economic growth by protecting workers. And I, that message seems to have gotten a little bit lost today. Well, Sarah, in the green room we were talking about one of the efforts that I guess you've been active in in New York City to try to, um, to have the government step in when trust is lost or contracts are breached for yes. freelancers. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, one, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> one thing that I think is really um, amazing, how many people here are freelancers or have freelanced at some point in the last few years? Great, so I mean, it's, it's like here. And one of the most important things about be, being a seasoned freelancer is that you have to build up your network because when you have too much work, you've got to give it to somebody who's not going to say anything and then will trade back with you. Or you have to find somebody because you're lonely in the house and you want to like meet for coffee. But you will, you will die on the vine if you are a lonely freelancer. And so what I think is so fascinating is that freelancers in their own networks have to build up this trust, in fact. And so I think that's like really worthwhile for us to be looking at what what are the what are the great things that are happening and I think that we are seeing greater levels of trust now so one of the major things in New York City is we have a bill in the City Council that has a majority of City Council members have already signed in support so uh, we are uh, hoping that this will be law soon and what it says is that if you work with an independent contractor in New York City you have to have a contract and if you don't pay your freelancer, uh, you can uh, be subject to double damages and attorney's fees, and that you have to pay people within 30, 60, 90 days. What's so significant about this, number one, is that the average freelancer has been stiffed $6,000. 70% of freelancers have been stiffed at some point in the last year. And talk about the economic implications of that, it's enormous. And it's very difficult because people have to then take this on as on their own. So coalition of groups from SEIU, the Teachers Union, Kickstarter, uh, 
the New York Tech Meetup, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, many others have come together, the domestic workers, the guest workers alliance, to say this is something that is happening to low wage workers up through professional workers and that we're stronger together than we all come together. And it's the first legislation for independent contractors as independent contractors. And I think that's gonna be one of the biggest trends that we're gonna to start to see is that independent contractors who have not been misclassified have to be able to start to build the safety net that is appropriate for the way they're working. And I think that's what's so encouraging from Seattle and in other places across the country that people are starting to come together as independent contractors. And I just think that is really important and often gets lost because it's a little bit technical about whether somebody's an employee or an independent contractor, but this is for independent contractors. So on the question of employee versus an independent contractor, um, one of the concerns that I have heard from employers, uh, particularly smaller employers, is that as the expectations, expectations or rather requirements that employers are required to provide uh, for their workers grow, including um, sick leave, um, parental leave, uh, various other kinds of benefits, that that raises the cost of having an employee um, and differentially lowers the cost of having an independent contractor who are often exempt from these kinds of requirements. And it further incentivizes basically employers to have to, to shift more of their labor requirements into independent contracting and away from full-time employees. Um, Betsy, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we deal with that concern. I mean, I, I, I am fully in support of creating sick leave and creating parental leave, but, but those kinds of benefits do make workers more expensive, particularly workers in a particular kind of contract? I disagree with that. Okay. I actually don't think they make uh, workers more expensive for a couple of reasons. One, uh, research has shown that paid sick leave is really uh, valuable because people, when people have communicable diseases, they come to work sick and they get their coworkers sick. And the thing about not having access to paid sick leave means you come when you're starting to get sick because you don't feel that bad and you think you can make it. That's actually when you're most contagious. So you spread all your germs around the office, then you come home and you're really sick, so then you stay home and that day you're really sick. By giving people paid sick leave, there's fewer, you actually can reduce absenteeism. So the real, and then the other thing is when somebody comes to work sick, how productive are they? So what are you really losing well, not, when you pay not, them to stay home? It's not just about sick leave, right? I mean, it's right, also no, no, about I the minimum that. wage so, like, from which so we can, but, contractors are exempted. Um, so the, the, but there are a number, I mean, research shows that firms that treat their workers better, meaning better pay, high, more likely to have leave, are more productive, better managed, and more profitable. So it's not, so there, there are some advantages to treating your workers well. The other thing is, so, that, that's one reason firms should do it. And in a lot of firms- In addition to getting into heaven and little things <laughs> there, 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 Firms that do it tend to learn, oh, it's not as costly as I thought it was gonna be because I, there's all these productivity advantages I, I didn't know about until I experimented. Um, the other thing is that the research shows that it mostly comes out of workers' wages. So they don't actually become that much more expensive because it's really hard for us to force up total compensation. Um, that it, for workers at the bottom, you do push up total uh, compensation. And that's why these kind of policies, they create uniform benefits for everyone. They, you know, most workers, you know, who would, most workers would trade off the stress of having to choose whether to take an unpaid sick day um, for a little bit lower pay when you ask people to choose that. And it turns out for most workers, that's actually the choice that's happening. Compen total compensation does not rise by very much. So firms are able to uh, businesses are able to adjust, except for when you're dealing with the lowest paid workers. And so when we pass these kind of benefits, it's helping us reduce inequality by lifting up the bottom without really raising overall costs by, by very much. So I think a lot of employers tend to say, oh, look, this is becoming so costly, but they actually have a lot of margins of adjustment that means that it's not that costly. But, but it, it, yeah, and it, anecdotally at least, it seems that more firms are tempted to reclassify, maybe they're misclassifying their workers as, as freelancers in order to specifically to evade 
some of these benefits. I'm just, well, is, the, this, is this something you hear from your members? Am, well, am I crazy? You know, no, I, I think that it's almost like looking at, um, well, Alan Kruger did this great work on minimum wage and found that it didn't at certain levels mean that fewer people were hired. But, you know, I kind of feel like this argument, we can get like three economists to argue this and three <laughs> economists to argue that, but at the end of the day, like we don't have a middle class like we used to. And when you look at cohorts and what they're expecting to be able to, to afford, it's just so different. And in some ways it's because we fall into the trap of having this argument that says, okay, if you get something better and we actually act in a civilized way, it's gonna cost a lot and other people are really gonna get screwed. And I kind of feel like this, this doesn't help our debate. I think what we really have to say is that there's a certain standard that we're not going to fall below because that's the right thing to do and we have to figure out how we're going to do it, which isn't to say that you don't pay for things and you aren't mindful of it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we used to have child labor and, you know, maybe they like make rugs better because their fingers are small, but that's <laughs> completely inappropriate. So we really do have to say that there's some level upon which we're not going to fall. And I think that's the problem. We've gotten very comfortable using this kind of economic economic arguments that justify an outcome that really has gotten to be just simply amoral. And so I just think that's, that's where we are and I think we, we have to kind of, we have to hold ourselves to that. Which isn't to say that the economic arguments are irrelevant or anything, but let's like, let's put the goal there and then let's figure out how we're going to achieve it. I think there's too much emphasis placed on what our employer is going to do. Workers are just as much of an important part of this equation as employers. And we need to be asking, you know, what are workers going to do? And what we want workers to do is to be able to engage to their full potential in the economy and the jobs in which they're going to be the most productive. And so we need to have the kinds of policies in place that allow workers to achieve that, that encourage people to participate in the labor force that encourage people to be able to balance you know, work and family, that, that encourage people to pick jobs based on where, what they're really good at, not what's going to allow them the kind of financial security they need because this is the only job that's offering time off or this is the only job that is gonna allow me to pick my kid up on time from daycare. Those kinds of, of policies are things that are you know, really important for the, not just, you know, for the economy, I mean, they're important for the economy, but they're important because workers and what they choose to do is what ultimately determines how much we produce as an economy, not just what employers choose to do. And you think do. you need to see signs that because we're having these policy conversations, even when we're not, you know, we haven't been successful at raising the minimum wage at the federal level, but the fight for 15 and others has been um, quite successful in, in parts of the country in raising this conversation. The conversation that we've been trying to lead from here about paid, uh, paid sick days, paid family leave, um, has also taken root in other parts of the country. So you see state and local governments ta uh, taking this on and actually raising the standards. But also you're starting to see a conversation about this sort of notion of conscious capitalism. And, and you have employers coming forward because the argument is happening, um, thinking about these very questions about the well-being of the workforce and how that actually connects to the well-being of the society at large and how we all have a role to play in making that happen. So even when we are not as successful as we would like to be at the federal level in advancing this policy agenda, I'm increasingly convinced that having the conversation in a forceful way is like opening up, it's opening up the conversation in ways around the country. It's hopefully having the effect of stimulating some of the organizing efforts that we're seeing around the country that are yielding successes that I think the hope is that those are the things which will ultimately find their way back to Washington so that we can pass the national standards that we're trying to get to. All right, let's open it up to audience questions now. I think we have some microphones floating around. So if you, if you have a question, please raise your hand or stand up and we'll get someone to you. Nobody? There's one over here. Somebody over here raise your hand? No. Yeah. Yes. And, and please uh, introduce yourself as well. Sure. Hey there. Uh, Amy Lightman with New America. I was really uh, interested to hear you speak about uh, the social movement building and how you think it's sort of coming back. I guess I'm a little more skeptical about whether or not it's coming back because I think there are a few pockets. But could you talk a little bit more about maybe other efforts that make you think there's sort of some systemic effort to mobilize folks? 
Well, so let me just say, I think that what the first step is, I think we're starting to really see the frustration in a coherent way, especially in the campaigns of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And I think people have really made it clear about what their frustrations are as workers and feeling like uh, it's, it's just been uh, so hard. And I think that part of it is that sometimes I think inadvertently kind of the do-gooders sort of decide that there's two kinds of workers, like the most vulnerable and marginalized who are worthy of concern and other workers who are maybe more middle class. And so I think what we have to do is start to to say, no, we're really talking about everyone for a variety of reasons, including that the economy does better when, when we have, have all a focus on that. I would say what's particularly interesting to me is just the rate at which people are organizing in a very decentralized and very local way. And so obviously the fight for 15 didn't just come about out of nowhere. I mean, it's had incredible support from organized labor, but that you are just seeing those kinds of movements. And then just the ability to organize really locally. So Freelancers Union, we have something called Spark, which is where local leaders in 23 cities are meeting and coming together and running their own programs. Uh, and the, we've built that in 15 months. And you start to see that with a lot of organizations. And I think we're, we're starting to see an, an emphasis on mobilizing in cities and, and a city agenda that I think is really fascinating that, you know, maybe it's in large part because people are saying, well, it's really hard to, to work in Washington. We're not clearly moving things along legislatively, so let's start looking there. And I think that that is probably the, the connection between the organizing around what makes a good city and the local labor efforts. And then I'd say the focus on independent contractors. So those are my three. And just for signs of progress as a result of those kinds of organizing efforts, you know, we're keeping track. We've tried to take a lot of these conversations around the country. And you see there are additional states that have adopted paid leave. You see uh, additional cities and, and states which have um, advanced the ball on minimum wage. But you also see it on Free Community College, where since the president made his proposal, we've seen it emerge in 27 different places and in a couple of entire states as well as individual programs. The same is true of expansions of child care. Um, where we've made progress in 34 states um, as a result of organizing that's going on and as a result of igniting a national debate which is taking root in various parts of the country. So there's more room for hope than you think. You just have to get out of this town sometimes. Question over here. Hi, I'm Valerie Young with Momentum and the Caring Economy Campaign. I wanted to talk about child care. You just brought it up. Uh, it has you, the only mention was the one you just made. Do you see or envision child care as not in the same rank as paid family leave and paid sick days, or is it just as much of a, a workers' rights and a workplace economic labor force supply issue? It's very, I mean, from the administration's perspective, it's very clear that, I mean, look, it's obviously, we think of it as something in the very best interest of kids. But it's also tremendously important to the presence of parents in the workforce and, the, uh, and their capacity to stay in, in the workforce. So if you look at the budget that the president has proposed the last couple of years, it's the most ambitious childcare focused budget um, uh, ever. Starting with this proposal to make pre-K available to every four-year-old in this country, but also going back to the earliest years. Um, and so, yeah, we see this very much as a workforce issue. And frankly, as in, um, uh, along the lines of, again, making sure we have the healthiest possible society and the best possible preparation for the workforce, frankly, making sure every kid gets to kindergarten ready to learn is an enormous part of that uh, overall effort. No, paid maternity and paternity leave is actually a child care issue and a, a child, an investment in children's issue. So it is, it's a, it's a great to have for the moms and dads, but it's a really important to have for the kids. And we, you see the returns. You know, the studies show that kids as adults earn more when their parents can take paid leave when they're born. I mean, that's crazy. But luckily, there are other countries where they've done these investments decades ago, so we can actually learn what happened. And it's crystal clear that investing in children from, the, from before they're born in early childhood pays huge dividends. It's the best investment we can make with a taxpayer dollar, and we're not doing enough of it. Other questions? Right here. Hi, uh, Ken Montes with the Life Feeds Work. 
One thing that's always struck me is that there's a lot of research that supports these ideas. There's also a abundance of business case arguments that push for these changes, yet they don't seem to be enough to push us over the cliff towards change. What are the other conversations that we need to be having um, in order to actually promote change? I think one of the, the biggest ones, and sort of to the point of the woman of where, where are you seeing these changes, I think the next thing we have to do is move from sort of social media conversations to actual institution building. And I sometimes feel like there's like a disconnect generationally. You know, so you think about like the generations, you know, I don't even know how many back where people were in like Elks and like the Lodge and the Masons. And you know, it was almost like people were so oriented toward being with one another. And you know, I, what's funny, my family actually had like the Horowitz Cousins Club and like seriously, like there was like dues paying and there was like a president and they like organized like all the get togethers and maybe that's why I do what I do. <laughs> you can buy it honestly. I did want to be president, but you know, anyway. Um, but I do feel like we should be trying to think about, you know, literally, it's, it's not that hard. You know, you need to figure out something. You think about how cooperatives started or meetups, you know, how you could like institutionalize a meetup by like actually p kicking in $5, you know, every meeting and starting to say someone's going to be in charge of holding that money. And I know that sounds like really mundane, but I, I feel like we need to go back to that. And I think, like, to, to put it bluntly, sometimes I think Ronald Reagan, like, just won, you know, for a bunch of decades because. Uh, we've really gotten so individualized, and it's like, even if you think of biodiversity and environment, it's, it's just not healthy. We shouldn't be so alone, but we do have to form structures and institutions and learn how to lead them and make sure that revenues exceed expenses. And, you know, I think back to the great eras of labor where labor had banks and affordable housing, and you had like, you know, progressive accountants and progressive actuaries, you know, it was like we knew how to run things. And I think like our do-gooder community, we don't run enough, like in a boring, mundane way. And I think that's what we, sh we should all be doing, boring, mundane institution building in a very romantic, visionary way. <laughs> so <laughs> um, as a person who relies a lot on that research and who engages in that research, I think that the the research is really important for us to understand you know, what we should be doing and where we should be going. But as an economist, it's really, really essential that everybody understand that what's good for the economy is not the same thing as what's good for narrow business interests. And those are two, you know, they're two very distinct things. And the research tends to tell us about what's going to be good for the economy, what's going to be good for society. Um, and we need to be able to break out of you know, narrow business interests and listening to employers complain, you know, that I don't want to offer this or that to my, my worker and take the big picture look. And the, the research is helping us get an idea of a vision, because I also believe in visioning what would a society look like in which employers took more responsibility for their workers, in which workers had more shared prosperity, in which we got the labor share back up to where it was. We need to be thinking about that vision and then trying to figure out how to achieve it. Well, thank you very much to our panelists. Um, and uh, thank you for all for, uh, for your questions. I think we're good.